So we need to support nursing and be able to advance the practice of nursing, allow nurses to practice at the top of their license, especially advanced practice nurses nurse professionals who have obtained master's degrees and, and enable them to practice at the top of their license and to be able to deliver the type of care that Americans need to be successful. You're listening to A Second Opinion, your trusted source engaging at the intersection of policy, medicine, and innovation and rethinking American health. Dr. Linda Burns Bolton, is the Senior Vice President and Chief Health Equity Officer at Cedars-Sinai. She joined Cedars-Sinai in 1971, was named Vice President of Nursing in 1991, and serves as the inaugural holder of the James R. Kleinberg, MD, and Lynn Kleinberg-Lincoln Chair in Nursing. Over a career spanning more than five decades, Dr. Burns Bolton has impacted healthcare policy, clinical practice and patient care nationally while elevating the role and enhancing the professional training of nurses. One of the nation's leading experts in the field, she served as president of the American Organization of Nurse Executives, the National Black Nurses Association, and the American Academy of Nursing. In our discussion today, Linda and I do a deep dive on the challenges in the nursing profession, including shortages, equity, and nursing education. I'm your host, Senator Bill Frist. Welcome to A Second Opinion. Linda, thrilled to have you on the show today, and not a day goes by without headlines on the sacrifices that nurses are making for us every day during the pandemic and have made over the last two years, um, day in, day out, and uh, the shortage of nurses, uh, the challenging worksite conditions that we ask nurses to, to work in, uh, nursing education, so many issues for us to talk about today, uh, especially also just to honor our, our nurses' bottom line. You bring a, a perspective that is so vital to our healthcare system generally, um, but a, a perspective that sometimes gets left out of the executive level and the boardroom discussions, and that's the perspective of the nurse. Uh, you serve as Cedar sinai inaugural senior vice president and chief health equity officer, and you previously served as their chief nurse executive, uh, so many positions, all every position that, that I know of in nursing you've held. Mm -hmm. You've led nearly, nearly all of our nation's top nursing organizations. Uh, you and I have spent the last nine years together on the board of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Board of Trustees. Um, you've spearheaded and informed a lot of the foundation's work and research on nursing with the National Academy of Medicine, and I could go on and on. But before we dive in, I would love for you to, to share with, with us a little bit about yourself and how you came to be one of the nation's preeminent experts and leaders in the field of nursing. Well, thank you very much for having me on. I really appreciate it. I, the opportunity to speak about nursing and its contributions to healthcare. Uh, I started off as a staff nurse in labor and delivery, believe it or not. That was my first job and I loved it. I loved it, I loved it as a, as a registered nurse. And I had been driving back and forth. I'm originally from Arizona and graduated from Arizona State University in 1970. That's a long time ago. And uh, then we came over to UCLA to go to graduate school. And, and throughout my career, I have always had a heart string pull for Arizona and have done some variety of things over, the, over my career to help Arizona as a state and the people of Arizona, more importantly. Uh, so in relationship to what things do I cherish, I cherish the moments I've had with the Native American families that I've helped, the African American families, others that I've helped, uh, all through the support of nursing. And nursing is, is about helping people do their very, very best, no matter where they are at in life. And so I've been privileged to, to be able to do that throughout my professional career. I want to jump into the issues. We've got so many issues to talk about, but just I, I love your story and the journey 
to where you are today because you've accomplished so much along the way. Just was there a turning point either in your early years or mid years? All of us have lots of turning points, I know. But well, you- I did have some turning points. So yeah. my junior year in, in uh, undergraduate school at Arizona State University, I had this professor of OB nursing and I just fell in love with her and thought I wanted to be an OB nurse and thought I wanted to go to Yale uh, to become a nurse midwife. And I told my mommy that, and mommy said, no, you cannot go. <laughs> so I didn't go. And uh, But I have always loved obstetrical nursing because of the value that I grew up with, with Native American and Hispanic and African-American women around me, supporting me through my career and supporting my contributions to health and health care. And so I've always experienced this pull towards OB nursing. Mm-hmm. And it was my pleasure to be an OB clinical nurse specialist, which is a wonderful job. I still think about that job and wish I could go back to it. After yeah. being at Cedar sinai for 51 years, you would think I would get over it, but I don't. You know, I cherish and miss the interaction with patients and families. Yeah. That is so significant. Linda, the the nursing shortage, um, let's talk a little bit about that because we hear about it um, coming in today, you know, listening to, to uh, just the news about where we are in terms of healthcare worker shortage. Uh, nurse employment has grown concurrently with U.S. spending on acute care over the years with with nursing unemployment rates rarely, this is in the past, exceeding 1.5%. But today, uh, worn, yeah. down, worn down by, by all sorts of reasons we can talk about, by the pandemic, broadly, just beyond nursing, the healthcare industry is experiencing these unprecedented working shortages, which means that the clinical care is impacted, the care of uh, people's loved ones, their children, their spouses, their, their extended family. and. I was looking at a a recent morning consult poll and it found that nearly one in five healthcare workers have quit their jobs during the pandemic. Yes, and especially nurses. Exactly, exactly. And and that four in five say that the national worker shortage has affected them directly and their place of work. And and as you said, especially uh, nursing. So let's in that ecosystem where it's a big problem for lots of different people, where nurses are so fundamental to the actual delivery of, of health and, and health care and well-being, what are some of the main reasons in your mind that we're seeing so many um, the nurses uh, leaving their jobs? Well, nurses are human beings first, you know, and they love the opportunity to work with other human beings. When they don't get a chance to do that, when they're so tied down with other things that the federal government or the state government has put upon them, then they feel like, why stay? And so unfortunately, so many of our compadres are leaving the workforce uh, and the schools of nursing are troubled significantly. Uh, Faculty members are down 20%. We talked about the general nursing population being down. The faculty members' population is even worse. And individuals are getting out of the business of healthcare and seeking to do something else. I frankly don't understand that because I would never leave healthcare. I mean, it's been my pleasure to be a nurse for 55 years, 52 years, excuse me. And it's been my pleasure to to be able to help other human beings. And so I would never leave nursing. But others feel like they, they, they just have to get out. They can't be with their families as long as they want to. They can't be with their loved ones. And there's the sacrifices of healthcare are so much upon them that they feel like they must get away, especially yeah, I mean, I, now with the pandemic going on. 
And what I, I was talking to some nurses the other day and, and who'd been at it a while, and it wasn't just one or two, it was, it was four or five that we were in a group talking. And they were talking that in their careers, the last year and a half, they've had more people um, yell at them, be disrespectful, use words that haven't been used in the past against them. And listening to it, it was, it was very real to me. It was very raw to me because having spent you know, 20 years in hospitals myself, um, I never really saw that. And, and um, I guess it, in part it's because the nurses are so much on the front line that they take the brunt of the, 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 the frustration. Yes, they do. But have, what is, what, is there something else going on in the hospitals that nurses during the pandemic just have to throw out their hands and say, you know, I can't do it anymore? Well, some of it has to do with what's going on in the American public. And that is, you know, COVID-19 has, in, in all of its glory, because <laughs> it has taken this country and this world by its coattails and spun it around over and over again. And, you know, it has made people afraid of healthcare. And yet they know that they have to have healthcare to deal with COVID-19 and, and deal with the very variations of it. And so nurses being on the front line and, and being the first persons individuals interact with. When, in my emergency room, when you first come in, who are you going to see? A registered nurse. Throughout your stay in the hospital, who are you going to hopefully see? A registered nurse. And so they take out all their frustration with having to come to a hospital having to be in a hospital, having to undergo all the things that are happening with disease and illness on the nurses. And that has been the story of nursing since I've been in, in the field. And, you know, when the first nursing charge started with Flo, Flo, with Florence Nightingale, the mother of nursing. And there was a nursing shortage then during the Korean War. And there continues to be a nursing shortage. There's always been a nursing shortage. There's not going to be enough nurses. So what do we do to try to convince the American public about the value of nursing and the value that they bring to the table in terms of health and healing? And without nursing, you can't have health and healing. And that has been true throughout the world. And more so here in Los Angeles, California, where we have significant number of institutions, but they're not, not always have the right nursing care being provided by those institutions. And so we need to have more nurses and we need to have people respect nurses for what they give to the American public and what they give to their family members. You know, uh, one of the, the most despicable things that I've seen happen is the number of individuals who come in blaming nursing for all their health issues. Well, you didn't do this, or you didn't do that, or why couldn't I have, have this or that? Well, that's not nursing's fault. That's, that's our nation's and how we're organized in terms of care. So when I travel around the world and I see nurses in different settings and community settings, and school settings and acute care settings. And I witnessed the, the power of nursing in those communities and say, why can't we do that here in the United States? Why, why is it oh, easier to be a nurse in Cuba than it is in the United States? Why is it easier to be a nurse in Germany than it is in the United States? Why is it easier to be a nurse anywhere in the world, including the world that has little of, of our assets? And yet in California especially, it's very difficult to be a nurse. And so yeah. individuals are leaving the profession, leaving healthcare, not just leaving the profession, but leaving healthcare yeah, let's in a little bit. Let's come back and talk a little bit about this, um, the whole education of, of nurses. Just just sort of wrapping up a little bit on the pressures that that nurses 
in our appreciation for the, for nurses, um, there was a, a opinion piece that the New York Times uh, released, Lucy King, who was a reporter there, has done a series of reports on nursing, and we actually have a video uh, out that I looked at uh, in the last couple of days. Um, but in the release of that, in some of the interviews that they've done over time, I thought it was a good uh, paragraph. They said about talking to nurses, they were grateful to us for representing their pandemic experiences. Not only were they nurses, but the dire situations forced them into taking on the role of surrogate family members too. Yes. And they continued, they were witnessing death at a previously unimaginable pace. Many nurses were unable to process what they were seeing at the time, guaranteeing that the psychological after effects would have a long tail. I mentioned that because I think it's a good description of, of some of the pressures that nurses right now as we speak are, are undergoing, which explains part of it. I will have to say in, in the New York Times video, uh, it, what the reporters did, they took it to a different, they said it was hospital greed, that hospitals had inadequately planned for, for not just the pandemic, but nursing shortages have gone on for years. Um, that, that takes us in another direction, but it does cause us to think there are lots of reasons for the shortage in hospitals today, but it does start with the sacrifices that nurses are being asked to make uh, in this 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 climate that none of us had had anticipated. Let, let me let me move and pick up a, a little bit. Uh, you and I have since we for the last decade have worked so closely at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And they are just notice in the boardroom, you know, your voice is so important. And everybody turns to you of our, you know, 12, 15 board members, um, because they know that the nurses are on the front line in terms of social determinants, of, of understanding in a more holistic way what's going on with patients, with their families on the ground. Not that every nurse is uh, at the bedside, but that the profession itself probably has more um, sensitivity presence to what's really going on in healthcare today. I mentioned all that because we've also talked about your role in the National Academy of Medicine uh, mm -hmm. reports. And just for, for our, our, our listeners, let's talk a little bit about that because I want to take some of these findings and say, well, how do you inspire people to go into nursing? Um, mm -hmm. the, do we have the heavy lifting? We have the long hours. Do we have the emotionally taxing work? Um, the flip side I want to talk a little bit about, and, and feel free to draw upon this landmark series of, of reports issued by the National Academy of Medicine on, on the future of nursing. And they they just, again, for our, 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 I want to share with our audience, the first one was in 2009, and that was looking at what we need to do to strengthen the capacity and education of the nursing workforce. And then the last report, which came out last year, put a heavy focus on charting a path to achieve health equity. Um, I mentioned that, and we'll have in our show notes how you can access those reports. Excellent, excellent, excellent reports. Deep research. But putting all that in, in sort of the, the bucket, are there some takeaways from the National Academy of Medicine's extensive research on the future of nursing that you can share with us? Yes, so the National Academy of Medicine, thank God, is, is an independent organization that is supported by many different other organizations, one of which is the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, which we are on the board of. And the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation uh, requested that the National Academy of Medicine do these two reports and to focus in on what is it that is going to be required to take the 4 million, 4 million registered nurses in the United States and enable them to practice at the top of their license and be able to deliver the best possible care. So we got a lot of nurses in the United States. You know, when we have more nurses in the United States than several countries have put together, but they're not able to practice at the top of their license. And so in the first report that I was on with Donna Shalala as the chair and I was the co-chair, we successfully launched that report and it broke down the National Academy of Medicine website several times uh, because people wanted to hear about what we had come up with. And we basically said, you need to allow nurses to be nurse 
and to be prepared to, to do the type of nursing that Florence Nightingale first put, a, put across in the 1890s. And, you know, they have not been able to do that. So the second report builds on that and says, we were successful. You know, we got more nurses educated at the baccalaureate degree and higher, 50% of nurses. Uh, and at the time it was less than 20%. Uh, we've increased the number of nurses who are advanced practice nurses, nurse practitioners, nurse anesthetists, you know, um, nurse midwives, and we've opened the doors wider in nursing uh, to allow more individuals who, who thought they could not become nurses because of their race or their ethnicity. So more African-Americans and more Hispanic and more men in nursing. You know, we quadrupled the number of men in nursing. Uh, and why bring in men? Well, they're the other part of the sex, you know, and, and they do bring a great deal to the table and have brought a great deal to the table, has, as has most of the BIPOC individuals, black and brown and individuals, patients of color, individual professionals of color, excuse me. Uh, and so what can we do with these two reports? Well, the last report, which was released last year and with, by the National Academy of Medicine, supported by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation said, we must, we absolutely must open the doors wider in nursing and bring more people in, but then we must trust nurses to do what they need to do. So we need to cut out all the stuff that prevent nurses from working at the top of their license. And we must support nurses as they are the number one profession that is supported by throughout the world, according to WHO, the World Health Organization. Uh, but to do that, we need to move down some things. So the medical staff, as an example, in some facilities still see nurses as handmaidens. And you do what I tell you to do, and that's it. And others, like my institution, which is a magnet designated facility, recognize the, the value of nurses and as partners, equal partners in healthcare delivery and focus in on what it is that we need to do to support their expansion. And that's what the second report did in terms of the National Academy of Medicine. How might we, how might we uh, advance nursing to allow them to practice at the top of their license allow them to practice in areas outside of the hospital, outside of the hospital, because most of the world doesn't come to the hospital, thank God, you know, and, and we need to be able to support nurses uh, in all areas of practice, and whether it be uh, nursing in prisons, because nurses are in prisons, nurses in homes, nurses in schools, nurses in places where you work, uh, nurses everywhere. And so we need to support nursing and be able to advance the practice of nursing, allow nurses to practice at the top of their license, and especially sec, uh, advanced practice nurses, nurse professionals who have obtained master's degrees and further, and yep. enable them to practice at the top of their license and to be able to deliver the type of care that Americans do. The need to be successful. Yeah, Linda, you mentioned we earlier in in our discussion we talked um, about nursing education. Mm -hmm. uh, I I used to get mixed up. Now I don't anymore. But all the different levels of nurses there are. So start with the very basics and. Um, and, and put either a hierarchy or, or describe it because you got LPN, you got RN, you got baccalaureate degrees, you got um, uh, nurse practitioners. Keep it real simple, but and start with I guess the least requirement for education and and build it out for us so I can understand the framework. Well, the United States of America is the only nation in the world that has three levels of entry for, into the profession. So the United States of America still has LVNs, LPNs, licensed practical nurses, 
who graduate from a two-year program or a year, pro, year plus program. And they practice at the lowest level of nursing. Then we have associate degree nurses who we're the only institution in, in the world that has associate degree nurses. Uh, they said this program was supposed to be there for a hot minute, you know, during yeah. World War II when we were desperate for more nurses. And so uh, she came up with, the author came up with this idea of, well, let's train nurses at the, at the associate degree level. Well, that stuck. And we have more nurses graduating at that level. And then the baccalaureate degree. So associate, degree, associate degree is two years? Two years. Right. And But you don't have to have a baccalaureate. So then no. you, you move up to requiring the baccalaureate. And, and what the are baccalaureate they is four years. You graduate from a baccalaureate program with a bachelor's of science in nursing. Right. All of the nursing professionals have to take an exam that is administered uh, not by the schools of nursing, but by the states, 50 states in the state of California, as well as uh, others in, our, in terms of our uh, other organizations that support nurses, uh, who, who demand nurses. Uh, they all have ways of licensing nurses and that licensure piece is, is a big piece of nursing. Before, before we get to the licensing, so you've, you've got me up to the back and you got my LPNs, my associate degrees, my- Baccalaureate. And then what? And then, and then master's degrees. Masters. Masters. And masters is either it's an advanced practice nurse, a nurse practitioner, a nurse midwife, a nurse anesthetist, you know, or a right. clinical nurse specialist, which I was. Right. Uh, that's someone with the master's degree, a higher degree in nursing, which enables them to be able to practice at the top of their license. Right. The state so allows them to do so, because uh, we have 50 states in the United States and not equal access to uh, being able to practice it at, what, at the top of one's you, life. You, you've told me in the past, as we've been around the table, that Tennessee doesn't do very well in that regard. I, no, it does not. Oh, gosh. But the southern states do not. Yeah, yeah. Is, no. is, so when, when, just so I, this classification, which helps me, is when somebody says a registered nurse, what is a registered versus a non-registered nurse? A registered nurse is someone who has taken an exam pass that exam in that state, in that state, because we do not have world statewide unification of, of passage rates. Uh, and, and so what it takes to pass uh, the license in the state of Florida or Georgia is different than what it takes to pass in the state of California or are, Washington. Yeah, and our licensed practical nurses, LPNs, are they registered nurses? No. Licensed practical nurses have graduated from a two-year program and they're able to sit for the LPN exam. Yeah. A baccalaureate prepared nurse or a diploma prepared nurse is graduated from a three or four-year program and they're able to sit for the registered nurse exam. Okay, good. Good, that's helpful. Now, let's go a little bit deeper on this practicing at the top of your license, because yes. I say it a lot because I know it's the you know it's right, and it applies to nursing, it applies to so many things in the healthcare workforce um, because of this tradition of, of not like cartel, but you know physicians have liked sort of having all the power in the past historically, and you know a lot now, and dictating what everybody else does. And that's been perpetuated in legislation at policy level, at the state level. But when we say for nursing that some states don't allow you to practice at the top of your license, tell me a little bit more what that means. Well, what it means is that some states, mostly, mainly the Southern states in the United States, restrict the practice of nursing to that that is deemed by a physician a physician who is licensed in that state, determining what they can and cannot do. 
Whereas in other states, like the state of Washington and the state of Oregon, nurses are free to practice in accordance with their education and their skills and ability. And we have fought for many years to open the doors wider in nursing to allow all nurses who graduate from schools of nursing, the schools of nursing, uh, to be able to practice at the top of their license as registered nurses. Not so much the licensed vocational nurses. We understand the difference between LVNs, LPNs, and registered nurses. Uh, but to go to school for two years to become a registered nurse at the associate art degree level, you have certain things that you're not able to be taught because of the time frames of graduating from school. So you don't get as much mental health nursing as an example. And where baccalaureate prepared nurses do have more courses in mental health nursing. Yeah, you know, I, I, I saw the, the future of nursing report um, that we've been talking about called for increasing the number of baccalaureate prepared nurses in the workforce. Uh, and I remember only about 66% of registered nurses are prepared at the baccalaureate or the graduate degree level you talked about, according to the, the latest workforce survey. Is in, in terms of since the first report came out, have we increased the number of, of baccalaureate? We've doubled prepared? the number of nurses with baccalaureate degrees. Yeah. Is that good progress, adequate, inadequate? It's good progress. Yeah. It's good progress. And yeah. we've increased the number of states that allow nurses to practice at the top of their license whether that license be a master's level nurse or baccalaureate prepared level. Yeah, so one of the things our listeners and, and uh, all over the 50 states need to do is look at their states, ask their policymaker, their local representatives, whether or not that is being allowed. And you mentioned mainly the Southern states and we'll put in our show notes who, who, who they are, but really uh, it's important for people to know, especially when other states have made so much more uh, uh, progress. Um, what about streamlining nursing education? Uh, it, 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 there's a certain body of knowledge you just have to have. Medicine, where we have internship for a year, and I did five years of, of residency, then two years of cardiac surgery, and then another two years of transplant fellowship. I went on and on and on. Mm -hmm. um, and there are plenty of ways you can streamline that. What about in the nursing sector? Are there ways to streamline the education or is it pretty tight in terms of expectations and delivery of content today? You want everyone to practice at the top of their license, whether that license is as an LPN or registered nurse. Yeah. And the, the unfortunate thing in the United States is that we have 50 different laws uh, in terms of practicing nursing. And that has not, and, and though there have been efforts made, including at the National Academy of Medicine to try to change that, we have not been successful. Uh, and that's because each of the states have their own legal rights to determine the practice of healthcare professionals. And that's true in medicine, right? You, you can practice in, in some states uh, and you can petition to, to practice in other states because of where you, where you graduated from. Uh, in the United States of, in, of America, you cannot practice nursing because you graduated from University of Georgia in California. You know, you have to yeah. retake some courses, yeah. and retake an exam. And so that those are the sort of policy changes that that can be made, should be made. Even the pandemic, yes, physicians have been uh, the regulations have been loosened, more flexibility to practicing across state borders. It's a little bit different than what you're saying about where you graduated from, though. But but this harmonization um, it is important, I think, especially in this time, critical times of shortages of people who are actually in the field. Do we have? I, uh, enough nurses, I, I, you know, I, I, I know we don't have enough nurses in the hospitals, in clinics, or in the field, 
but in terms of the training, if you just say nurses with the measures, are there enough of them out there? And is the problem that we need to improve the working conditions or the payment or the practicing at the top of one's license, or is it we just don't have enough? It's a combination of both. So even those states that have significant number of nurses, take my state, state of California, which has over 115 nursing schools, 115 nursing schools. That's more than the entire Western part of the United States. Mm -hmm. But we don't have as many individuals graduating at the baccalaureate degree level or higher. Yeah. And because of that, it restricts our ability to provide safe delivery of care. Yeah, for our viewers and, and our listeners, I just want to remind of everybody that the nursing workforce does represent the largest of the healthcare professions. It's nearly four times the size of the doctor workforce, four yes. times. Four We're million talking. registered nurses in the United States. Is that what it is? Yes. Four million registered. Four million. Uh, in the various capacities and, and given their numbers, nurses are, are uniquely positioned to manage teams and to link clinical care are uniquely positioned as we've seen with the, the whether it's the testing or diagnosis in, in public health, um, in social services. And I, I you know, came head to head with this when I was setting up the heart transplant program uh, mm -hmm. in Nashville at Vanderbilt. And we were building it from scratch, a fellow by the name of Dr. Walter Merrill, um, mm -hmm. who was a, pro a professor there. Um, and I joined him and we built that team. And I'll have to say today, it's the largest heart transplant program in the United States of America, the, yeah. the program that was built. But it was not built, and it was intentional, it was not built by more physicians. It was built on nurse leadership. Yep. And uh, literally from the and nurse uh, practitioners, yeah, the nurse practitioners and the um, other registered nurses on the clinical side, on the research side, on the public health side, on the management of, of immunosuppressive agents and detection of infection. It was built on this backbone of framework of nursing, not surgery. And the surgery was good. And, and we were sort of in there designing and, and, and working, but it was a team approach. And it was, I would attribute 99, 90, I don't want to over exaggerate, 95% of the success. And the reason that it is the largest in America today is built on this nursing. And, and I, I wanted to say all that just to put it in perspective of the size of this workforce, the challenges we put before it so that we as a society can appropriately support, whether it's financially or organization or delivery or changing of the laws that 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 you mentioned uh, it's a huge huge issue and once again the, the reports have been consistent in the way they've reported uh, through the national academy of medicine with the support of the robert johnson foundation and, and your leadership but the pandemic has really torn this cover off yes. and pull the band-aid away where you can see what what we what we need to do let, let me let me switch a little bit because um uh, and in, in the introduction, I mentioned, mentioned that you're Cedar sinais Chief Health Equity Officer. Mm -hmm. um, today, the non-medical or the social determinants of health have become really ubiquitous in all of our conversations about the drivers of health outcomes, results. We didn't talk much about social determinants 10 years ago. Now everybody mm -hmm. begins. They lead with that. And you know, I know... Um, it, it doesn't mean that providers, especially nurses, are in a position to always address them, but frequently they are. Are there changes that need to be made so that healthcare professionals can feel empowered to address patients' issues of nutrition, of housing, of transportation, of safety, these, these social determinants? And is it reimbursement models? Do they play a role? Is it education or is it a, just a combination of things? It's a combination of things. So in some states, in the United States, nurses are, are able to practice at the top of their license and therefore are able to address issues outside the walls of hospitals, which is very important because people don't live in hospitals. They live in their neighborhoods. Yeah. 
And so to address the issues in Mississippi of the lack of, of clean water, you know, it needs nurses and engineers working together. And nurses have taken on roles of what are the things that are causing people to be thrown into the river instead of just pulling them out and, and, and treating them. And uh, going upstream and finding out what's causing the disease and illnesses that we are uh, impacting the ability of Americans to be successful. So nursing has, has broadened to include that. And there are so many more programs uh, that are preparing nurses to be able to be active members of society and doing what they can to keep people from getting in the lake in the first place. And, you know, instead of just pulling them out and putting them back together and throwing them back in the boat. Right. Well, what about rural health? I, Tennessee rural, rural health is, is, yeah. is an entirely different uh, makeup. Yeah. A, you have lots of um, individuals who are not licensed who are practicing nursing care, who are delivering nursing care. B, you don't have enough registered nurses or physicians. And so you might have a physician who's the town physician, and he may have thousands of patients under, under his or her uh, ballywhack and supported by a registered nurse who's a member of the community and often loved by the community for what he or she does, as well as that position. And yeah, so, you know, and, and I want to stay on this topic, so I want to let you finish, but these studies that I keep reading have found that nurse practitioners yes. are more likely than physicians, than doctors to practice in rural areas, that the number of nurse, nurse practitioners is expected to grow. I think the figure that I see most common is 6.8% through, yep. through 2030 annually, which is good because physicians are only going to grow about 1% at, at most. And, and most of the time, those nurse practitioners live in those communities. Yeah. They want to help those communities. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's just the, the, I just want to underscore and emphasize the importance of, of nurses as we look at rural health, which is one of the, the, the uh, great disparities in healthcare that, that, that we see that we underscore today when we look for the solutions it is much more likely to be nurses, yeah. I guess specifically nurse practitioners here to a certain extent, since the, as you point out, the physicians are, are so rare and they are more likely than physicians to go uh, or return to rural areas, uh, which I find really, really interesting. Anything else about the rural health or nursing and rural health that, that we should mention? Well, nursing and rural health has, is they are of the community, and they come back to give to the community. Now, of the community means they grew up there, you know, so they know the issues that, you know, they know why Mrs. Smith continues to, to come into the hospital every other month because she's not, get, doesn't have her diabetes under control. They know why Mr. John continues to have problems at work because they, they haven't fixed the issues that are contributing to his problems. And so they work hard to, to be a part of the community and do the work of the community. And many of them go on to take on jobs that are not outside of nursing, but nursing is a, as a profession is, is, is one that we see everything is part of us. We'll be the, the, the locomotive leader if we have to, we'll be the teacher, we'll be the gardener, We'll do whatever it takes to get healthy and stay healthy. Yeah. What What are we doing? Uh, coming to staying on the health equity and at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, it has been right at the top of our agenda that you've worked on, that I've worked on. You're the health equity officer there. Uh, talk to us a little bit about how well we're doing in terms of racial uh, diversity. I, I I read in the NIM report, the National Academy of Medicine report. I quote. The racial diversity of the APRN workforce has not kept pace with those in the basic RN workforce. Today, most APRNs are white and female. 
I mentioned right. that really, I put that out there, not necessarily to talk just about that, but I wanted to pull that out to introduce how we're doing in terms of racial diversity in the profession. We aren't. We aren't doing very well. We have not done very well in advancing nurses uh, of color, BIPOC nurses, black and brown and 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 uh, individuals who are native to this country, you know, getting them into positions of power and and prestige, which is actually associated with master's degrees and, and higher. A, because it's more difficult to get in, and B, because it's more expensive to get in to those programs, but even those that have been successful. So the National Coalition of Ethnic Minority Nursing Associations in SEMA received a grant from the Department of, of, of Health to address this issue. Uh, 10 years ago, and they've been very successful in increasing the number of individuals of color who are from Native Americans, Pacific Islanders, uh, African Americans, and Hispanics who go on to uh, address nursing as, as a requirement to being successful in, in this country. You need to be healthy. So how do you get healthy and stay healthy? Well, you need a nurse. Yep. What about leadership roles? I'm trying to think of some other obvious issues that I think about where I see in my daily activity and the non-clinical, the clinical, the private uh, investment world, the entrepreneurship world, um, the nurses increasingly are in leadership positions. I say that, and then the next meeting I go to, I look around, and not only, you know, we have a long way to go. Anything uh, about how we can make sure that that nurses are appropriately represented at the highest levels, and I guess I'm thinking a little bit more clinically now, thinking about our healthcare systems, whether it's the payer systems or the hospital systems or the ambulatory care systems out there, uh, I, I mentioned it in the transplant world, I, and they continue to rely so heavily on nurses in leadership roles, uh, but is there anything that we can do to accelerate that interest, that passage, since the nurses do have the best, I think, perspective in terms of at least clinical care when we're talking about uh, advancing the welfare of patients? Well, we need to open the doors wider and allow nurses to get in. So there's a group of nurses who have been very successful, advanced practice nurses. Uh, so you take the nurse anesthetists, oh my goodness, have they shot up in terms of their capacity to deliver care and how they're utilized. But if you take an, an advanced practice primary care nurse and she or he has very difficulty getting a job and sticking with that job and advancing their capacity. So even within the profession, there are this, this hierarchy exists across the profession. If you, are, uh -huh. if you are an advanced practice nurse and you are an advanced practice nurse in anesthesia, you can, you can write your ticket anywhere and you're gonna be successful. But if yeah. you're an advanced practice nurse in primary care, you're not going to be as successful because you're working up against new physicians who just graduated who are trying to also get a job uh, as a as a new as a novice. And nursing brings with it the fact that if if you're a master's prepared nurse, you've had baccalaureate training and been practicing as a staff nurse. And now you're an advanced practice nurse. And so it makes it very difficult for you to access care in different levels in the organizations. Is there uh, any, is there any, uh, probably now, or over the course of this podcast, thousands of nurses will be listening to this podcast. Is there anything that, that you would say in terms of advice or counsel to them on this topic of leadership? You've, so you've been, you've done it. You've participated and continue to be so active and impacting and shaping the profession itself. What, what advice would you give to nurses who want to have a, a greater impact or a similar impact to you and play leadership roles in healthcare? So start with your own institutions. 
So begin there and, and seek to advance. And if you can't advance in that institution, leave and go someplace else where you can advance, not, not be uh, handicapped by some institutions have very restrictive advanced uh, practices. And so get outside of your comfort zone and, and reach out there. As an African-American nurse, that's what I've had to do. Uh, and I've been a nurse for too many years, 52 years, and an and advanced practice nurse for 50 of those years. And what I've had to do, though, is move out of the state of Arizona, which is on restrictions, to a state like California and that, that allowed me to practice at the top of my license. And that's what we want all health professionals to be able to do. So I do want to end with this book, The Five Graces of Life and Leadership. It's a great book that was given to me by my president for as a holiday gift. And my president is a, a, a big supporter of registered nurses. He's the one who allowed me to be, become the first advanced practice nurse in, in Cedar Sinai and to advance to my current role. Uh, but this book is it's a great publication. I encourage the, the listeners to purchase it and read it, The Five Graces of Life and Leadership. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the book because we I, I typically always ask. What is, he is what the is CEO the, of Corn Ferry. CEO of Corn Ferry. And uh, pick the book out. Let me see the cover again for those people who are, who are on video, YouTube. Good, The Five Graces. Well, listen, thank you so much. Let, let's close, Linda, with... Um, Talking to, and again, we'll bring things to a close right now, but is there, um, what do you say to nurses today? What do you say to the, the, the person who may be listening, may be thinking about being a nurse or has been a couple of years into it uh, about nursing, where they are, the choice they've made, um, and anything about how to get the most out of it and how to contribute the most? Well, first of all, recognize that you are in the driver's seat. You are in the driver's seat. Everyone is looking for a nurse. And so if you're thinking about coming into nursing, come into nursing at the highest level you possibly can, what you can afford to do. But recognize that it's not the end, that it's just an entry level. And be open to opening doors at all levels to expand your opportunities to be effective. And to be effective, you have to have changed laws and changed the way people think about nurses and nursing, because we want people to think about nurses as individuals who are care for other human beings, who are exquisite in their knowledge and their expertise, but they're, they put on their clothes one wrap arm at a time, like just like the rest of us. And they are exquisite because they have knowledge and expertise that, and they want to share that knowledge and expertise with you. So be good to nurses, be good to yourselves and love a nurse. Linda Burns, Bolton Senior Vice President and Chief Health Equity Officer of Cedar sinai Linda, thank you for taking time being with us uh, today. I, I learned so much. Uh, most importantly, you inspire, I know, so many others. I know you inspire me, but so many others as they look at a career in, in nursing. And it's up to all of us together as a society to support that sort of direction and make sure that the ecosystem is appropriate, uh, proper, uh, appropriately resourced and moving ahead. Thanks so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. This episode of A Second Opinion was produced by Todd Schlosser and Invenium Creative Strategies. You can subscribe to A Second Opinion on Apple Podcasts or wherever you are listening right now. And be sure to rate and review A Second Opinion so we can continue to bring you great content. You can get more information about the show, its guests and sponsors at asecondopinionpodcast.com. 
a second opinion broadcast from Nashville, Tennessee, Music City, USA, the nation's premier ecosystem of health services, where we engage at the intersection of policy, medicine, and innovation.